Would you pray with me, please? Father God, by the presence and inspiration of your Holy Spirit, open our hearts and open our ears to receive that that you want us to know today. Father, do with us as you please. Bring to our minds ideas, messages, inspirations that will guide us to you. We thank you for giving us your Son. And we thank you, Father God, for his holy resurrection this day. In Jesus' holy name, amen. You may be seated. In your bulletins, for those of you that like taking notes, in your bulletin there are, uh, there is a page, I believe it's at the back of your bulletin, and there are, you can have pens or there may be pencils in the pew in front of you, and you can take notes, um, and not just notes of the things I say, but perhaps things that the Lord may say to you as you are listening to me, or a particular passage of Scripture is mentioned, it may be that the Lord begins to speak to you in new and wonderful ways, and I want you to write it down, and then later you can pray about it and ask the Lord what He is meaning to say to you. Around the year 400 A.D. or so, 400 in in the year of Christ's era, There lived a man by the name of John Chrysostom. John Chrysostom was an archbishop, archbishop of Constantinople. He was born around 347, and he died about 407. Chrysostom wasn't his last name. Chrysostom means golden mouth. Golden mouth. Because he's very well known as a defender of the faith and as a very great preacher. And so he became known and is known today as John Chrysostom, especially in the Eastern Orthodox Church, but he is a bishop of the entire church. And in one of his Easter sermon, a portion that I read, and I just thought I wanted to repeat for you something he said on on one of his Easter sermons. He said, Hell was in uproar because it was done away with. It was in an uproar because it is mocked. It was in an uproar, for it is destroyed. It is in an uproar, for it is annihilated. It is in an uproar, for it is now made captive. Hell took a body and discovered God. It took earth and encountered heaven. It took what it saw and was overcome by what it did not see. O death, where is thy sting? O Hades, where is thy victory? Christ is risen, and you, O death, are annihilated. Christ is risen, and the evil ones are cast down. Christ is risen, and the angels rejoice. Christ is risen, and life is liberated. Christ is risen, and the tomb is empty of its dead. For Christ, having risen from the dead, is become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. I just could not not tell you what this man said. It's just so powerful. Friends, there should be no doubt in all of our minds, all of you that are here today, There should be no doubt whatsoever that Jesus Christ existed. 
that Jesus Christ was born and lived in Palestine. There should be no doubt in anyone's mind that he had a great following of men and women that followed him everywhere he went. There should be no doubt in anyone's mind here today that Jesus Christ was crucified, nailed to a cross in Judea at the hand of Roman soldiers. The testimony of these things about the life of Jesus come not just from the Bible and not just from the Gospels. This testimony comes from a number of non-Christian sources, both Jews and Romans, who told about the events that had taken place in Judea. This is the testimony that we know. But the primary source of these events come from those who followed him and were eyewitnesses and were even willing to die. And they did. Each one of the apostles and each one of the early believers in one way or another, died for what they knew to be that undeniable truth of what they had seen, what they had heard, what they saw, what they touched, what they lived. Their willingness to suffer, their willingness to die, and some of them even die horrendous forms of death. It's a testimony of their conviction that Jesus Christ was who he claimed to be. And this was news that should not be kept secret. They died, martyred, 99 of 99% of them, only John survived into old age. All the other disciples died martyred everywhere that they spread in the world, testifying that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had come into the world, had died, and had risen again. It was too big a news to be kept under secret. They were willing to die for what they knew, and they also knew the world needed to know it. Eternal life had come into the world for all people, everywhere. Their testimony is what we proclaim today in our service. As part of our service, there is a moment in which we are all going to say these words. Jesus died. Jesus rose. Jesus will come again. That is the basis of their faith and the basis of our faith. Jesus died. No question about it. Jesus rose. No doubt about it. Jesus is coming again. That is the hope and the assurance of the church, and that's why we're here. Jesus had been crucified on Friday, just two days before Sunday, three days before Sunday, before the beginning of the preparation, the day of preparation of the Jews. The day of preparation started on Friday at 6 p.m. Or actually started on Thursday at 6 p.m. Passover would start at 6 p.m. of Friday evening. The evening of the day of preparation begins with Jesus preparing the disciples by celebrating Last Supper, by giving them what I called on Thursday the life, the, the, the testament the testament of the Lord. It had started on Friday that he was crucified very early in the morning. The Lamb of God had been killed. 
Sins were forgiven on Friday, not today. Sins were forgiven when Jesus atoned, paid the price of our sins. Jesus died in substitution for us, the truly guilty ones. On Friday, Jesus took upon himself the punishment of our sins. And then we know he was brought down from the cross by friendly individuals, Joseph of Arimathea and others, and the women and John witnessed as they carried the body of the Lord, wrapped him up in in cloth, in linen cloth, did the best they could quickly because at 6 p.m. Passover would have begun and everything had to be completed in the Jewish life. And they rushedly put him inside a tomb and they put a big, huge rock in front of it and some soldiers were placed to guard the tomb. All of that before 6 p.m. of Passover. That Saturday, the Saturday of Passover, instead of it being a great day of celebration and a great day of observing what God had done to them, bringing them out of Egypt, instead of a happy observance, remembrance. It must have been for Jesus' disciples and followers the darkest day of their lives. Imagine for a moment that you're one of them. What does it feel like when someone that you love dearly, a son, a daughter, a grandchild, a spouse, dies What is your next day like? That Sabbath, instead of celebration, must have been the darkest, quietest, somberest day that they had ever experienced. The most heart-wrenching day of their existence. Their world and their hopes had been dashed. He whom they considered the Son of God had been miserably executed and killed, and they were left without direction. They were left with questions. They were left with sadness. They were left lost and in fear. That Sabbath was not a joyful occasion. That Sabbath was the saddest day of all those who had hoped in Jesus. And then as a sign of love and devotion... And I want you to understand this. The women didn't come to the tomb because they had faith. The women were coming to the tomb looking for a dead body. It wasn't faith that brought them to the tomb. What brought them to the tomb was love for their Lord, their teacher, their master. Love and devotion, a desire to spend a few more hours perhaps with his dead, buried body. Anoint him, anoint him with fragrances, anoint him with spices which is kind of what you did to say farewell to someone. 
a last moment of bathing the body, a last moment of showing respect and honor. The women were not coming expecting resurrection. The women were coming just because they loved, just because they loved their Lord. They were coming as early as they could. I mean, I can see them as the sun begins to come out, them rushing through the roads to get to the tomb. And only the women, because the men were terrified. The men were scared that they too would be caught as followers of this Messiah, be thrown into prison judged similarly and crucified just like him as rebels. As an example that no one rebels against the Roman Empire. The women come in love. The men may have loved the Lord, but they're so fearful they've locked themselves into a house in the city of Jerusalem. Gripped by fear. And what the women find is something to, so opposite to what they were expecting to find. The women, instead of finding the rock blocking their entrance to their beloved Lord, they find that the stone has been moved away. Luke is very clear to tell us with that word away that it wasn't just a cracked open. It was removed completely and probably thrown a distance. Luke wants us to understand that whatever happened that night, that morning, it was so powerful that the stone could not hold it. The stone was moved away. That's what they found. And when they look inside, instead of finding the dead body they came to anoint, they find that the body's gone. And the clothing that the body was wrapped in is just laying there. They find the body gone. Instead of finding soldiers guarding and stopping them, what they find is two individuals. And Luke describes them as two men in dazzling apparel. Angels. What they find instead of the silence of the tomb and the finality of death, They find a message from the angels. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but has risen. This week I was reading an article from a a dear man that I don't know personally, but I follow a lot in his books. His name is Ravi Zacharias. He's a... He's an apologist for the faith and a great evangelist. And he wrote an article that caught my attention. And the title of the article is that the angels did not say he is no more. What the angel says is he's not here. He's no more is what we might say when someone passes away and we might say he's no more. But when the angels say it's not he's no more, he's just not here. Which implies a lot more than the finality of death. He's just not here. Go and tell the disciples. Go and tell everyone that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Not he's no more. He's just not here. He will appear to you later. And here begins, on Easter morning, begins a series of 40 days 
in which Jesus continuously appeared to his disciples daily, daily, appeared daily in numerous places and in numerous ways and eventually even appears to James, his brother in the flesh, who had refused to believe while Jesus was doing his ministry. He had refused to believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be. And now he appears to James and James comes to faith, and James become one of the three pillars of the church in Jerusalem and the author of the letter of James in the Bible. You can read his faith in that letter. For 40 days, Jesus began to appear to different people, some traveling to Emmaus. They find him in the road. He appears to the women. He appears to 12 or 11 as they're gathered in fear. Then Thomas is not there. And next Sunday, he appears, this time Thomas being there. Then he appears to James. Then he appears to 500 brethren at one time. And eventually he appears to Paul. Paul, the biggest persecutor of the church. The one who wanted to stamp down the message of the resurrection. The one who opposed the resurrection and persecuted any message of the resurrection. He appears to Paul, who was then called Saul. And Paul becomes, brothers and sisters, the greatest evangelist that the world has ever seen. In fact, most of what we believe today comes from Paul. Most of what we affirm today is Pauline. Paul becomes the voice of the church to the world, while the rest of the disciples were the voice of the church to Jerusalem and then spread east and all over the place. But Paul is the one that reaches Rome and reaches soldiers in Rome who possibly, possibly are the ones who take the faith to England. And that's the faith that we practice as Anglicans. The faith that Jesus Christ died, that Jesus Christ rose, that Jesus Christ is coming again. Pauline theology is what we know and affirm. And yet, believe me, he was the greatest persecutor. He set his life to stomp down the message that Jesus had risen from the dead. For 40 days, Jesus appears to so many people. Not one, not two not in certain circumstances, not in a dream, but he actually says, touch me, see the wounds, see my hands, give me some food. He gives them every proof possibly that he who was dead was now very much alive. For 40 days, and these men and women went out into the world to tell people that Jesus Christ was who he claimed to be. The resurrection of Jesus was an undeniable truth. An undeniable truth that needed to be shared with everyone at all cost, at all sacrifice of life, at the cost of reputation, at the cost of persecution at the cost of imprisonments, at the cost of stonings, at the cost of whippings, at the cost of every abuse that a person could possibly endure. The disciples endured it, not for a lie, but for a truth they had seen and touched and heard and lived with. For the days that Jesus was with, with us. Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. 
because Jesus had risen from the dead, life and death were a reality. Life after death was a reality and a possibility. If Jesus could rise from the dead, then life after death is true. If Jesus rose from the dead, there's the potential that all of us would rise from the dead. If one lives after having died, then all could have the same in Jesus and through faith in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus had risen from the dead, death had been conquered. Death no longer, you see, death no longer has power. Death no longer has that sting we fear. Yes, we don't like death. None of us like to die. But we know for certain that after death, we have life waiting for us. There's no finality in the grave. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we know that we too will rise from the dead. Because Jesus had risen from the dead, he was who he claimed to be. Friends, if he promised resurrection and he did it, then he knew what he was talking about and he is who he claimed to be. As the Son of God, as the anointed of the Father, as Messiah. Because Jesus had risen from the dead, eternal life was guaranteed. Guaranteed because he promised it. Your eternal life is secured in Jesus Christ. Because he, the Son of God, promised that he will not lose one that the Father has given to him. That whosoever comes to him will have eternal life. He has promised it. And to assure you of that promise, he went ahead and rose from the dead victorious over death, over Hades, over hell, and over all enemies of the believers. So how do we receive that eternal life? How can you receive today eternal life? How can you receive it today? Well, there's only one way. There's only one way. And I'm going to share with you what Jesus had to say. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And then he said to Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And Luke writes for us in the sermon of Peter in the book of Acts, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Salvation comes by faith and through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Not by works, not by race, not by family association, not by church membership. The, the resurrection of the dead comes through Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul reminds us of this in Romans chapter 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. 
How do you receive eternal life? Through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. No one else has the power to resurrect you. No one else has the authority over death. He gained that authority by walking out of the tomb fully alive. And he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And all things will bow down before him. He's the one that guarantees your resurrection. He's the one that is your savior, your king. And you can only receive this gift and this assurance through faith in Jesus. And through the proclamation with your mouth and your testimony for future generations that Jesus Christ died for you and rose for you and is coming back for you. You are not orphans. He will come again. I'd like you to see a video that I have prepared for you to see. So we cry out, Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Stand with me, please.